Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in tube lab number 134, we're going to take a first look at our new universal kit phono preamp. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Well, Charles came back. I'm back. And with Charles back, I finally had enough free time to finish the Universal Kit Photo Preamp. So we're going to take a look at it today. And let's just, we're going to do a quick run through today, and then we're actually going to listen to it, uh, which is really interesting. And, um, and we're going to do at least one, probably a couple more episodes in which we go into the detail, the specifications. And so let's just start at the top. So this is a, it's a dual mono preamp and it follows the same topology of the really, um, well thought of, uh, universal. 6 or 12 SN7 preamp. It's been our most popular kit. Yeah, by far. It's a great sounding preamp. Um, so that topology is very much the same. It's actually using the same uh, transformer. A lot of the power supply components are the same. And it's based on the voltage gain tubes are going to be the Right now we've got the 12 SL7s in, mm -hmm. but... It's going to play everything like the 6 SL7, just with a simple swap of the uh, of the heater voltage, just like with the Universal, and yeah. also the Loctal equivalents, like the 7F7 and the 14F7. Yeah, 14F7, and there's more tubes too, aren't there? Well, uh, we've got something a little bit different here in the cathode follower stage, and that is a 12 SN7. Right, so... Because the, um, because the filament supply is a switch mode power supply, an SMPS, or one of those, you know, ugly... Actually, I have one on the desk. Yeah. There's almost always one on the lab You desk. might call them a power brick or... Yeah, it's what... There it is, right there. So this is actually the one that I we have in the store. It's the one... I, even though I have a high-quality DC... I have a couple of high-quality DC supplies on the bench... I use the actual switch mode that we sell with the kits. Well, you have to buy them extra, of course, but uh, that are available for the kits in all of our testing. So that helps establish the noise floor. So it takes a lot of tubes, and that that means that we give it the designator universal, right? Yep, just like with the universal preamp, but uh, it's designed to use a lot of tubes that are still available. Yeah, and the one thing you can't do though is you can't have, let's say, a 6 SL7 in the voltage gain stage and a 12 SN7 in the cathode follower stage, right? right? They've got to match voltages with each other. So if you're running a 6 volt tube in the front, you're going to run a 6 volt tube on the out, and if you're running a 12 volt tube on the front, you're going to run a 12 volt tube on the out. Everybody got that, right? <laughs> okay, let's flip it over. And now there's a few extra bolts in here, of course, because this is a prototype chassis, right? Everybody knows that. So here's your two power supplies. So if, you, if you're a dual mono, you want two power supplies. You could build it on one board, but I like to just have a complete separation. And we power up, this signal comes in right here. So the right channel, I don't know if you can see it there, but you can certainly see the, the left channel over here. And it goes into the left board and into the right board. And because these are actually working prototype boards that Charles developed for me, and they still needed to be modified. So this... MacGyver looking <laughs> sculpture of resistors and capacitors. This, this is much, much of this is the EQ circuit. It's not going to be like looking like that in the final kit. <laughs> no, Charles will have a dedicated board that he's going to design for us. Hopefully this week uh, coming and all these, every, every component has its own position on the board. Um, so, and a lot of resistors on these boards tend to go on the other side because there's space for them over there. 
Mm -hmm. But anyways, Charles is the master at designing quiet boards with no electrical issues. So we're going to leave that to Charles. So basically you have a first gain stage and then you have an EQ network. This is in between the stages right here. Then you have a second gain stage. And at that point, you've got all the volume you're ever going to get and your EQ, right? The RIAA equalization that's applied to records has been reversed, essentially, and it's now flat. Um, and now it goes into a cathode follower. And the reason why we like to use a cathode follower, typically people call this a CF stage. <laughs> call it a cathode follower stage. That's fine. Um, is that we are coming off of the voltage gain stage with very high impedance. And we could, we could drive um, most preamps with that high impedance, with sh fairly short cables, and we wouldn't adjust the the EQ too much. Mostly it's in the treble we would adjust it, but it's safer to bring it off of a cathode follower stage. And we're going to look at this in more detail, but basically we have low impedance coming out. So we're not going to do the schematic today. It's not all I have actually are working schematics. So Charles will have to make us up a fancy colored looking one, but that that's for another day. So out we come into low impedance and that's, that's the, that's both channels inside one chassis, so a dual mono design. And um, I think really today, what I'd love to do is to listen to a really well recorded track. We recorded directly off, let me flip it over. We recorded directly off the output jacks onto our high res zoom h5 which is it's an amazing digital recorder and i i we, we actually recorded what did we record three or four songs yeah and this was our, we never know what the royalties will allow us to play and won't allow us to play and uh, so we record a, a a number of tracks and then you know whatever our favorite track is that passes the royalty sharing rules on YouTube, then that's the one we use. So this is an interesting album. This is a CTI live album. CTI was started by Creed Taylor in the late 1960s, but the heyday for CTI was the 1970s. CTI was a was a modern jazz label. They they worked with. Um, uh, much the way traditional Hollywood movie studios worked, they had, they had basically a a group of high quality musicians that I think were under contract with them. I'm pretty sure. Um, and in the summertime, they put on these concerts at the Hollywood Bowl. Here's some reproduction tickets that were put into the covers. Really nicely done cover. CTI did decent covers. Everything was at least good. And um, they did what they called an all-star summer series. And they recorded quite a few of them. And there's, there's three, um, three albums. I found the first one in uh, one of my favorite record stores, um, you know, Cheap Bin. <laughs> and it was, this is it. And it was in minty condition. So I, I, I was able to find the, uh, the second and third album on Discogs for very reasonable money. And, you know, people don't play these albums. The, the jazz is, well, you're going to hear it in a minute. This was the beginning of, of a genre of jazz that was called soft jazz. Now, this is not Muzak. If you're, if you're as old as I am, you know what Muzak is. It's not canned music, uh, but it, it, was, um, it was a more uh, laid back kind of a sound. It was meant to chill out to... Uh, it wasn't necessarily that deep in which you had to listen to the track, you know, a hundred times before you say, oh, I get it. <laughs> but it does sound really good. It does sound really good. And I'm just going to show the inside. I can't spend too much longer here or we'll be over time. But look at that audience. And um, the um, on guitar, you're going to hear uh, the famous George Benson at his finest. So without further ado... Here is CTI's Summer Jazz at the Hollywood Bowl, 
summertime. George Benson. Okay, Charles. So um, now that we've had we've had quite a few critical listening sessions with the new phono preamp. Uh, we, in fact, we've been listening to it through version one, version two, version three point zero, three point one. We're actually on three point one V, and it's progressively gotten better with every version. That R I A A equalization circuit is a pain to figure out. <laughs> well, it's a pain to get it tweaked. Um, for I mean this we're using the this is based on the 6SL or 12SL7 tube and it's not a tube that's commonly used right I mean the 12AX7 is the common high gain tube well, so it would have originally been used for this though which is really interesting if you look at the RCA receiving tube manuals the early phono preamps were using these tubes Possibly. You know, I've been looking to see if I can actually find a manual. People say that that was the case, that the original um, RCA passive circuit used the 6SL, but I never found the schematic. So who knows? But that's what people say online. But they would have definitely tweaked it. And we're not going to go into the details of the impedance of the circuit and how it affects the EQ. We're not going to do any of that. What did it sound like? Uh, fantastic. Detailed, quiet, no noise in the background, and just very, very dynamic. 
I found. Yeah, I mean, when I started designing this, I set some basic parameters, right? I said, I, I want to have... I want to have clarity. I want to have soundstage. So that means right away, that was easy, right? It's going to be a dual mono design. In fact, after I built the very first prototype dual mono preamp um, and heard it for, I only listened to it for like a minute. I said, I'm never going to build a conventional. Um, That's what we hear from other tests, uh, from kit builders as well. As soon as they try a dual mono design, they say the soundstage just opens right up for them. That's right. That it's just it, you get that that's your given and I wanted to have I wanted to have a warm rich sound so we went with the 6SL 7 2 because it's a warm rich sounding twin triode right yep and the 12 AX7 even though it's got more gain and it will make technically a better preamp because it will have a higher gain hmm. we we'll talk about the gain of this preamp we just made it to the a required a required output level yeah yeah with the 12 ax7 we could have had more voltage than we needed right mm -hmm. but then 12 ax7s are getting rare they're getting hard to find if you have a phone that runs them it's it's harder to sort, source good vintage tubes and i don't think they quite have that warm rich mid-range no the i don't 6SL. think they can compare yeah. yeah so so that we got that with the tube that's that warm rich sound is really a tube choice the circuit maybe helps a little bit in the choice of coupling capacitors, but really the tube gets you there. Mm -hmm. And then the the noise floor, well, the the gain of this circuit without the EQ in is roughly 750 times. <laughs> so the EQ drops that down to, I think it was 250 times? Somewhere around there, yeah. So keeping this thing as low noise as possible was so important. Yeah, so... You'll never, if you turn up a phono preamp, uh, you're never going to be as quiet as a solid state unit. That's just a given. Mm -hmm. The main thing is, is you want, you have a groove noise when you're playing vinyl and you want your noise floor of your unit below that. You can't hear it while you're sitting in your listening chair and, and we reach that. But that was, I would say that was about a quarter of my time and I've got what three four five five months I started before Christmas so yep <laughs> yeah, it's hard to get these things so quiet. I've got I've got over four months <laughs> so yeah uh, and we're going to go over the details in a future episode okay well what came in this week okay let's get this out of the road for you oh we don't have a whole lot of surprises today let's get these out here and zoom in a little bit So, these have been really popular lately, and this is, of course, the 6GU7. Let me see if I can... Oh, it's right there. There we go. But this is a version that we haven't shown off yet, and this is the Japanese-made version of the 6GU7. We haven't had a lot of them in before, but we just got in a nice order, and so we've been able to match up a number of pairs of them. And unlike the other 6GU7s, these have a bit of a unique sound all their own. And they're really nice, they're pleasant, they're warm, they're detailed. Uh, I'd say they don't have quite as much bass as the other tubes, but they're doing their whole own thing and they're they're just great sounding. Yeah, they've got there's something going on in the mids up into the treble that is really interesting. It's like there's some extra air in the space around the music. Yeah, something like that. But, um, you know, we're going to listen to them some more, see if maybe we can nail that down a little bit. But they're nice tubes. They come in nice boxes. There's a beautiful vintage Raytheon box. Now, not all of these are branded Raytheon. They're all over the place. So, yeah. Well, Raytheon had a partnership with Toshiba. And, geez, I'm trying to remember what the... And uh, were. Hitachi as well, because... Uh, Hit Ray, I think, is Hitachi Raytheon. I right, believe. that's yeah. who I'm thinking of. That was the relationship. So um, these tubes may have been made before that uh, formal company was set up. And so Raytheon just rebranded, re basically. Um, do we think that's a Toshiba tube? Is that what we're thinking? Well, I'm actually not sure. We're not um, sure yet. Okay. Yeah, so it's going to take a little bit of research to figure that out. But um, all we know is that it was made in Japan. There are really are only a handful of manufacturers right 
So there's Matsushita. Matsushita and Hitachi and uh, Toshiba, I right. believe. Yeah, and Hit Ray Tubes, even though Raytheon was a 50% partner in that uh, endeavor, all I believe all the tubes were made by... Um, uh, Hitachi themselves. Hit, right in yeah. Japan, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, of course, you can use these in many spots where 6SN7 can be used using one of these nine pinned octal adapters. And how have they been working uh, out? They've been great actually. And we've been getting some reviews in on people that are using these in 6SM7 spots, including a few using them in Wilsontons and just being blown away by the sound. Yeah, so people are starting to put reviews into the store, which is great because it gives gives people who are, you know don't know uh, uh, what, what personal experience other buyers are having with the 6GU7. Um, it's giving them uh, first-hand accounts and the um, people are liking them. I mean, it, yeah. it is a different sound though, right? I mean, we're, it, we're recommending as a sub for a 6SN7, but it's not an equivalent sub in the sense that it's going to sound like a 6SN7. It, it does, doesn't sound exactly like any 6SN7 you've ever heard, but it does sound good in its own right. Yeah, it becomes, well, and which makes sense because it is a different tube, even though the mm -hmm. specs are very close to the 6SN7. It just gives you a really big option to switch over your sound. And of yeah. course, I mean, I say this often, and it's worth repeating, the tubes are the amplifier. So when you change out one 6SN7 for another 6SN7, you get, you'll get a shift in the sonics, sometimes fairly big, but most of the time fairly subtle, right? Mm -hmm. But when you put a 6GU7 in, which has this very extremely clear, clean sound with lots of air, um, you get you get a different amplifier. <laughs> it, it changes it quite a bit. Yeah, I mean we put it into our universal uh, six or twelve SN seven kit preamp, and it sounds like a completely different unit. It sounds yeah. completely different. I mean the topology below that's allowing that sound to come out is still the same. We still have a dual mono circuit. We have a very quiet circuit. We've got lots of reserve current capability in the larger than necessary transformer. So all those things are underlying the tube and supporting it but ultimately when you plug in that tube you you really have a different preamp yeah so and that's you know that's fun <laughs> that's just like you, you don't get that option in solid state equipment you got to buy another <laughs> another preamp yet another preamp. so so by the time this video goes up we're going to have these in the store if anybody's interested in having a listen to them uh, we don't have anywhere near as many as we do of the more common types like the RCAs, the Sylvanias, the GEs, but we do have a number of really nicely close matched pairs. So if you're interested, come check them out. Okay, well, if you stay to the very end, here's some discount codes to help you out. And there's a secret code that people have been grabbing up and there's a two secret codes. And... Um, the one that's easy to figure out, people have been snatching, and there's one if you spend the big bucks, you could figure it out, and nobody's used it yet. And for that, I'm grateful, because that's going to cost us some serious money. So we have flat rate shipping around the world of $20, and if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on us, folks. Stay safe, have fun. This is Jim and Charles signing off. Cheers, everyone.